Give me Facebook family. I had some technical difficulties with regards to my video showing um, through the aspect of Facebook. And again, um, I had to shut the video down, had to shut the video down to go forward in regards to our study on tonight. Again, we are in the Song of Solomon, chapter number six, verses four through 10. So I had to restart the video uh, again. So forgive me for that. Um, but I think we've got everything squared away at this juncture in time. So with that being said, I'm going to go to read the scripture out of the Song of Solomon, verses uh, chapter 6, verses 4 through 10, and hopefully get some explanation in regard to uh, what's going on. For those that are joining us, again, we are the conference call line is open. For those who may not have internet access, just give them the number 978-990-5000. Uh, text that to them and make sure they use the access code of 148-924. 148-924. So, with regards to that, we're going to dive right into our lesson for the night. Again, I'm reading from the NIV version, chapter number six of the Song of Songs of the Song of Solomon. Let me read thusly. It says here, it says, You are beautiful as Terza, my darling, as lovely as Jerusalem, as majestic as troops with banners. Turn your eyes from me. They overwhelm me. Your hair is like flocks. A flock, a flock of goats descending from Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep coming up from the wa from the washing. Each has its twin. Not one of them is missing. Your temples behind your veil are like the halves of a pomegranate. Sixty queens there there may be, and eighty concubines and virgins beyond number. But my dove, my perfect one, is unique, the only daughter of her mother the favorite of the one who bore her. The young women saw her and called her blessed, and the queens and concubines praised her. Who is this that appears like the dawn, fair as the moon, bright as the sun, majestic as the stars in procession? And so with that being said, what we're engaging here on tonight is, again, this particular passage of scripture in the Song of Solomon that hopefully will help us to engage again more of the deeper rootage of the foundation of this book, that relationship only happens through truth, fellowship, and friendship that is together. You can't have one without the other. And so this is the engagement that, again, we have. In the beginning of chapter 6, what you have here is the friends of the daughters of Jerusalem go through a process and, and say to the, the Shulamite woman, where has your beloved gone, most beautiful of women? Which way did your beloved turn that we may look for him with you? And so um, verse 2 says, My beloved has gone down to the garden. This is the Shulamite woman speaking. Uh, to the beds of spices, to browse in the gardens and to gather lilies. I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. He browses among the lilies. And so these first three verses really are kind of a beginning of chapter six, where now there is some unction that the daughters of Jerusalem have with regards to this man who we believe is King Solomon, but really speaks toward the aspect of the Christ figure. So this, they're saying to her, where has your beloved gone? Because at one point or another, they were trying to figure out, well, why did you let him go when he came knocking at your door when we read that? in previous chapters, I think specifically chapter five. So what we have is the engagement now, even of the daughters of Jerusalem that say, well, we'll help you look for him because now after she made, the Shulamite woman made testimony to how great and how good and how benevolent and how kind um, and benign this particular man was, they now have an attraction to him and they're willing to help the Shulamite woman find uh, find this man because now she's in search of him but she also makes precedence and says okay my beloved is going down to his guard so she knows where he is she also gives reflection to tell even the daughters of Jerusalem that this man is mine and, and what does this mean for us from, from the, the Christ standpoint? What, what, this, what this really says for us is that 
when we really get a hold of Jesus and, and begin to encompass what Christ is about, okay, then we'll come to some real realization of how great and how good God is to the point where we will boast and testify and give homage and praise towards God, even in our countenance, even in our voice, even how we express um, our goodness to God and others will see it. Even And the hope is that even when others see it, that they themselves will go looking for him, okay? That they will go trying to seek and find Jesus as quickly as they can. And so, so with that comes this whole adage also is that she begins to understand and know that he's in the garden, okay? And now how do we know this? This is kind of the beginning of chapter 5 where he says, again, uh, we believe that Solomon is the one speaking. I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. She goes in, cha in uh, chapter 6, verse 2, and says, My beloved has gone down to the garden, to the beds of spices, to browse in the gardens and gather the lilies. I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. He browses among the lilies. So she knows where he's gone. So she's going after him. She's going to seek him. She wants to find him because she does not want to let him go. And I want to let, let you all know something. Again, when you get a hold of a good thing, okay, something that you know is upright, it is holy, it has unique attributes to it that you know um, can be kept and not just kept from the standpoint of coveting it, but from the place where you know it's something that is going to help you maturate, mature, grow, and excel in your relationship, in your relationships with people, or in just your overall growth, okay? So when you're intrinsically trying to find those good things, those things that Paul talked about, whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are are, are, are virtuous, whatsoever things are, are kind, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. So this is why it's so important that when you get hold of a good thing, and specifically knowing that Jesus is the best thing you could ever grab, once you get a hold of Christ, you can't let him go, okay? And, and if you even feel like you've lost him, remember that you haven't lost him, but you can always go through the process of asking for forgiveness for sin, for things, for indiscretions and, and wrongs that you've done in order to reestablish yourself back in friendship and fellowship, right relationship, back to God, back to Christ. This is very important. So this is kind of the prelude of chapter 6. And in verses 4 through 10 is what we're going to get through uh, on tonight to talk about what um, what the man or Solomon begins to express, okay? And we're going to break some of these components and pieces down tonight, and hopefully it will bless your soul, and hopefully we can all engage in some level, high level of discourse uh, in regards to the conversation with regards to the text that we are reading on tonight. So with that being said, the scripture goes and says, in verse 4 of chapter 6, you are as beautiful as, Tir as Terza, my darling, as lovely as Jerusalem, as majestic as troops with banners. Turn your eyes from me. They overwhelm me. Your hair is like a flock of goats descending from Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep coming up from the washing. Each has its twin. Not one of them is missing. Your temples behind your veil are like halves of pomegranate. Uh, 60 queens there may be, and 80 concubines and virgins beyond number. But my dove, my perfect one, is unique. The only daughter of her mother, the favorite of the one who bore her. The young women saw her and called her blessed. The queens and concubines praised her. Who is this that appears like the dawn? Fair as the moon, bright as the sun, majestic as the stars in procession. So these are the verses in this particular text. And let's go back to verse four. When it says, uh, the man says, you are as beautiful as Terza, my darling. Now, Terza 
actually was um, was a tribe, uh, was a city, actually. Um, Terza was a city, uh, and, and the, the, the folks who inhabited it, that particular city, were of the Israelite tribe of Manasseh, okay? And so the, the meaning of Terza actually means acceptable or pleasant. It, it literally means acceptable or pleasant. So he goes through this process um, of saying, okay, he compares her to Terza, which now we know is pleasant and is acceptable. Then he goes in further, he says, as lovely as Jerusalem. So Jerusalem, which mean, which literally comes from two Hebrew words, Jerusalem, which literally means the city of peace. So the city of peace, if it's a city of peace, Jerusalem, means that the city in and of itself is very well put together. It means that it has um, an infrastructure, or at least the creation of it, that should be inhabitable, that is uh, connected and interwoven. It's not all over the place. It's not sporadic and here and there. No, it's all put together. And he says that this woman is as lovely as Jerusalem, as acceptable and pleasant as Terza. So he's beginning to give praises to this woman, seeing all the pieces uh, of her. But remember in chapter five, she was utterly unkind to him. Remember that she was the one that called for the man and the man came running, knocking at her door and she wouldn't answer. But this is the very same man who has looked beyond her faults, has seen her needs and still is infatuated with her. Okay? And, and I need to help you with this. So um, he pronounces in a very... Um, significant, happy, and amiable way how beautiful she is, okay? And, and I'm going to bridge this. I'm talking really from the humanistic side of it right now, but I'm going to bridge it to the spiritual in just a second. So, again, when we look at Jerusalem, this all to put together city, it is a holy city. So even there's a sacredness that he even denotes, if you will, toward this woman, even when he even mentions the, the mentions the city of Jerusalem, okay. So what we see here is um, again these tie-ins of holiness, pleasantry, being acceptable, being put together, well put together, and he's happy about it, okay. So it's very interesting, even in verse two, verse four, he goes, he says, as majestic as troops with banners. And one of the things you, the military aspect of, um, of this, what he talks about, when you see an army, okay, an army will have their flag or flags. And so with that, those are banners that speak to what that army is pledged to, okay? That, that the army is pledged to either a particular person or a nation or something of that nature. And that's why they hold their banners to signify who they are, even when they're going through the aspect of attacking in war or not attacking. When you go on a military base, flags are flying. Usually you have the flag of uh, a flag of the United States Army if it's an army base. The United States flag, excuse me, also the state flag in which that particular base is housed. And so with that, this is why you have all these pieces of components because these, these flags represent your allegiance. What what you are or um what you hold an allegiance to, or what you are pledging your allegiance to. Okay? Now I'll get to verse 5 in a second. But he mentions all these things. But remember what I said before. This was the same woman who denied him after she called him. She denied him even after she had called him. And he came. And he answered her call, but she wouldn't answer the door. 
Now, I want you to see something here with regards to human relationship. Truly a true friend will be there for you. Through thick and thin, in some way, shape, fashion, or form, they're going to be there for you. Okay? But I want you to also think about this from a Christ standpoint. That regardless of what we do against Christ, if we call on the name of Jesus, he'll show up. Jesus will come to our door and knock, and even when we don't answer, even when we don't answer it, he will come to our door, come to our door, and still knock. But even if we don't answer it, he still looks upon us with kindness and favor. And that is truly tied to his grace and mercy, no doubt about it. So, so I, I, I want you to, in your mind, just get this in your mind. Don't worry uh, so much about all the bad you've done. This is why we can come back to Christ to ask for forgiveness in regards to that. But the reality becomes this, is that even with the things we've done, have been so horrible and deplorable that Jesus still looks at us with favor. And again, this is where his grace and mercy abide in, around, and through us. Okay? So with this, we, we, we see and I'm reading something from my uh, study here. So I want you to think about this. So he begins a process where he kind of owns himself in love with her. Okay. And what he does also is um, he, he goes through a process where, where now he's trying to figure out, or not really trying to figure out, but he's trying to go through a process where he's starting to explain more and more why he is still infatuated with this woman. Okay? Now, verse 5, he goes in and says, Turn your eyes from me, they overwhelm me. Now, this doesn't really make a lot of sense when you really read it. Uh, because you're like, why would he say that? Why would he say, turn your eyes from me? Um, from, from somebody that he looks at and loves and adores. Well, it's, it's kind of a, a yielding thing. Uh, let me explain. The whole turn your eyes from me, they overwhelm me. He's looking beyond the faults. He's looking beyond the, the indiscretions. He's looking beyond um, the foulness and falsehoods that may be contained within this woman. He's looking beyond that to see something deeper. But what he also says is that you turn your eyes, he said, turn your eyes from me, they overwhelm me. Because when he looks at her, looks at her, he still sees the shine of his beauty. Or the shine of her beauty. Okay? When you think about this from a Christological standpoint, it, it really makes sense because this is what Jesus does for us or in us. We are still the apple of his eye. Because what he's trying to do is look at us and see a reflection of himself. Okay? And when he sees that reflection, it is very bright. Very bright. Even if we are overly contaminated in sin, God still made us, and he knows within his creation, he has placed that good, holy, and sacred thing inside of us. So when he sees it, he gets overwhelmed by it. Not that he steps away from it, but that he gets overwhelmed by it because it literally is a part of who he is. Now, I know I've said a lot there from that perspective, but essentially that's what we get out of this passage. So when he says, turn, when the scripture says, turn your eyes from me, they overwhelm me, it's not that he's trying to turn his face and turn his countenance and turn his total being away from this woman. 
No, what he's saying is, is that even beyond the indiscretions, I see the light, the light that's in you. And so that light shines brighter than any indiscretion that you might have, any sin that you may have committed. Okay? Now, hopefully this helps us in the midst of this particular study and it helps guide us into some greater um, searching, if you will, greater searching with regards to our own countenance. See, this is when you hear, when you hear in Scripture that, that, that God doesn't look at us as man does, but that he looks at the heart. And this is why it's so important that we go through the process of understanding more and more that we can't place judgment on ourselves self to the degree where it will cause us a further demise because of what we've done in a sinful manner, in a sinful nature. That even in the worst of what we've done, God still wants us. God still desires us. And more importantly, God still looks at us and still sees that light that he placed in us. Okay? I hope this helps somebody. Now, true friendship that can you look beyond what somebody has done and still be able to say, okay, that person is not the sum total of the ills they've done, okay? That God has still created them and so there's no way that I can look at them and judge them because I have my indiscretions too, okay? And that's why it's important, again, that we don't get so caught up into the heaviness of judging ourselves to the point of demising ourselves. That God is still correcting and reproofing and cleansing and washing. He's still doing all that. And because he's doing that, we have to trust God for that, for that washing and cleansing because we ourselves can't do it for ourselves. Okay? Let me go a little further in the text. It says here, um, verse... Verse 5, part B. Your hair is like a flock, uh, is like a flock of goats descending from Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep coming up from the washing. Each has his twin, and not one of them is missing. Stop there for a second. So there's this gauge again that begins to show um that begins to show how the engagement of his liking her goes into, again, the descriptive nature of your hair is like a flock of goats descending from Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep coming from the, up from washing. Each has its twin, and not one of them is missing. So, again, there is this recentering of, of, of le or level of expressing expressing what I would call not necessarily perfection, but at least what is being seen is that the flaws aren't being seen. Okay? The 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 um the sparing notion of her being unkind and not answering his call when he came knocking is not being seen. He's not seeing that. Okay? He's still giving praise. Uh praises regarding her and that he's speaking about all of the good things of her now see this is this is important because society would help would, would try to get you to come to a place to say well if 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 you decide okay if you decide that um you, you did something that you decided to do something bad, okay, to, to sin against God. Society would, would attempt to hold that against you to a, such a degree to keep you in a place of suppression. Spiritual, physical suppression, you can go down the line with that. But that's essentially what the world would attempt to do is to play on your weaknesses to try to make you feel that much more weaker, okay? Now, remember, I told you what she's done. 
She wouldn't come to that door when he came knocking. And because of that, he doesn't focus on her unkindness or her withdrawing from, uh, from, her, uh, from him. He's only giving positive reinforcement to her. All of what he's saying is literally based off the attraction that he continues to have for her. And I want you to see something here in King Solomon's language that is definitely, definitely has a direct tie from our, our study of Christ. Is Solomon is speaking to her and the poetry and the word and verbiage that he uses has no inclination of anything filthy. Um, it, it's not condescending. He's not blaming her. He's not pointing the finger. He's not doing any of that. But he's doing just the opposite of what somebody in his position, position would have done if they were denied by this person, which is exactly what she did. She denied him. She denied him. She withdrew from him. She was unkind to him. But his response is not being unkind to her or pointing the finger at her or being judgmental at her. What he does is he says, you are fair. You're beautiful. You are a star in the sky. The language that he uses, again, goes to the aspect of saying that you're still all put together. And matter of fact, you would even be deceived to think that she's perfect. Even though she's not, he's explaining and saying because of his love for her, he speaks only those things that affirm his love for her. He doesn't say anything that would downtrodden her and make her think so self-conscious uh, conscious about the some of the evil things maybe she had done, even to him, he doesn't reinforce that. He doesn't bring back a record of wrongs. He doesn't do that because that's what love doesn't do. Love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. That's 1 first, first Corinthians chapter 13. So he doesn't, he doesn't keep a record of wrongs. So he makes it a point to still speak in the affirmative about who she is, even though in reality, she does have scratches and scars and bruises. And yes, she is flawed and she has imperfections. But God, the man, doesn't focus on that. And guess what? Christ doesn't either. Christ doesn't focus on that. What about the woman that was caught in the act of adultery? Perfect example. What does Jesus do? He writes in the ground. And when, when, and when the other Jews were around and said that the law of Moses says we should kill her, what does he say? He starts writing in the ground. And what does he say to them? Well, those that were without sin cast the first stone. And immediately what he did was he threw it back in their face, not in a condescending way, but made them think that what's so good about you to pick up a stone to kill her? Because that same stone, you should be hitting against your head and trying to kill yourself. So don't try to judge someone based off their action of what you think. Because at the end of the day, your righteousness is as a filthy rag, so it doesn't matter. You have sinned too. You've sinned as well. Don't you deserve that same punishment that you're about to uh, that you're about to give this woman. And this is why it's so important, again, that when in that sequence of events, when they all start dropping stones, what was the next question Jesus asked her? He asked her, he, when he asked her the question, he said, where are your accusers? And she said, I have none. Because everyone had left. And the next thing Jesus said, he said, I don't accuse you either. Go and sin no more. See, that's the thing, is that society is so ready to accuse you of all the ills and bad stuff that you've done, not knowing that 
not 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 um going to the place of their own conscience realizing that they've done that and even worse but they wish to pick it out on you maybe because they want their attention and light to be shined on you rather than that light to be shined on them because they know they've done they've done all they've done all types of sin and dirt and so forth they know they've done that but to get the attention off of them like yeah yeah she's wrong he's wrong and this is why it's so important that we look at the standpoint of what the man is saying because all of the language is laced and saturated in love it is braided in love okay and and again this is so important for us to understand because this is the mind of christ so when we even engage in our churches and this is this is huge for me why is it that we as christians can be the first ones to be accusatory, publicly accusatory. Okay? I want y'all to just, just think about that. You don't have to answer, but just think about it. Just think about it. Because from that perspective, that's going to lead us into a greater sense, if you will, of our identity to God and how God truly loves us so. So when we read John 3, 16, it should take a different adage for us. For God so loved the world he gave, he forgave as well. When Jesus was on the cross, he, he, he petitioned to the, to the Father and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's love. It really is. Because if someone is beating you, Half, being you to the place of half dead, scourged, lynched on a tree, your whole body to be exposed, for the elements to hit you, and ultimately that you die from suffocation on a tree, and your words to God in, in that moment is, Father, forgive them. That's love. Man, that's love. That's love. Um, let me read a little further here. Um, verse seven, he says, your temples behind your veil are like, like the halves of pomegranates. 60 queens there may be and 80 concubines and virgins beyond number. But my dove, my perfect one is unique. The only daughter of her mother, the favorite of the one who bore her. The young women saw her and called her blessed. And the queen, the concubines, praised her. So what you see here, again, and I'm going to read from the commentator writer, and I'm going to kind of discuss a little bit more. Says, uh, uh, for those to whom much is forgiven will love the more. Okay? So if you've been forgiven for a lot, you'll love even more because you know the penalty of what you should have gotten, you didn't get because you were forgiven for it. Okay? And consequently, will be more love. For Christ has said, I love those that love me. He is pleased with his people. Notwithstanding their weaknesses, when they sincerely repent of them and return to their duty and, and commends them as if they had already arrived at perfection. He prefers her before all competitors and sees all the beauties and perfections of others meeting and centering in her. So this is where you get in verses 8 and 9, the whole standpoint of the 60 queens there may be, and 80 concubines, and virgins beyond number. But my dove, my perfect one, he even says it, my perfect one is unique. Okay? So so what, what he does is, is the man looks at this one woman and says, yes, there are 60 concubines, and then there are 80, uh, excuse me, 60 queens, 80 concubines, so 140 other women, and then goes in further and says, um, and a, a, a multitude of virgins beyond number, but this one, okay? This one 
is my perfect one. Now, I want you to understand something as we read this. That even with all of us who believe in Christ, that Christ still is relational to us on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And, and, and this is really important because he, this is where that he truly, with Christ, we're truly the Christ of, uh, truly the apple of Christ's eye. That even with everyone who's calling on his name even now, that he still has a direct, intimate, personal relationship with you. And that's why it's, 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 it's uh, that's why, that's why he's the son of God. That's why he's part of the Godhead. Because of the multitude of his strength that even when he's talking to everyone else, he's directly talking to you and to me. And he's speaking to us on a very intimate and individualized manner. Even in the multiplicity of all the conversations that he's having with believers in the world. And that always fascinates me. Always does. So many people calling on the name of Jesus that I can still feel his presence one one. And that makes our relationship personal. It makes the friendship and fellowship intimate. Personal. And that's why I serve the God, why we serve the God and the Christ that we serve okay um going through the mix of a few things here um it goes a little further again it says again um but my dove my perfect one is unique the only daughter of her mother the favorite of the one who bore her the young women saw her and called her blessed okay queens and concubines they praised her so even in the midst of it, what this man realizes still that she excels all of them, okay? That she is far more beautiful than all these other women. Again, that personal relationship, okay? So, so with that, there is this level of language um, that comes with that that's personal. And also, it, it, it goes a little further where she, uh, that, that she kind of included all the rest of them. Now, let me help you. So again, the, the, the scripture says, other kings have, have, many, uh, have many queens, concubines, virgins with, uh, whose conversation they uh, entertain themselves. But my dub, my undefiled, is to me, is to me, instead of all, is that one, I have more than they have in all of theirs. So, I want you to understand something. Because this kind of goes both ways. If, if Jesus thinks that way about us, okay, how should we think about him? Because now, he looks at us, again, that that he can take care of everyone else but still have that personal intimate relationship with us that is only me and Christ and that's it and that is ultimately unique okay um this is important again from how we view the perspective of our relationships with God and how that 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 piece those pieces and parts are engaged as we engage uh god spiritually okay now uh one of the pieces here and i'm going to get here and get to this in a second one of the things that the commentary writer says is yet they all constitute one catholic uh, what's one church are all but parts of that whole okay and that is my dub my undefiled Christ is the center of, ch of the church's unity. All the children of God that are scattered abroad are gathered by him and meet in him. He shows how much 
she was esteemed not by him only, but by all that had acquaintance with her and stood in relation with her. This is when she go, he goes and says, the young women saw her and called her blessed. And the queens of Cogabias praised her. So that she was, rec she was recommended, or, or excuse me, that she was her mother's darling, okay? That, that, that she was, um, that she was a special child. But, but what Solomon is talking about is that he's, what he's doing, he's going through the process, again, of setting her apart. Same thing that Christ does with us. Christ sets us apart. Even though he has conversations and relationships with so many other believers and other people, he sets us apart and he deals with us individually. And that's why it's so important that we engage on that personal relationship with God because he is a personal God. He is a personal Christ. Okay? And then... So, so there was the admiration that she had from all of the other women, okay? Take notice of this. Those that have any correct sense of things cannot be convinced in their conscience, whatever they say, that godly people, that, God, uh, that godly people are excellent people. Many will give them their good word and more their goodwill. Jesus Christ takes notice of what people think and speak of his church and is pleased with those that honor such as the fear of the Lord and takes it, takes it ill of those that despise them, particularly when they are under a cloud uh, that offends any of his little ones. So what's amazing here is this, this, uh, this adage, if you will, that um, people can't be convinced in their consciences that godly people um, so those that have any correct sense of, of things cannot be convinced in their conscience, whatever they say, that godly people, uh, the godly people are excellent people. Many will give them a good, their good word and more of their goodwill. So again, within their sensibilities, people will see the greatness in someone, even they wish to admit it or not. The reality is the truth will set and say there's something special set apart for this, by this individual based on their relationship with God. They may not be able to put their finger on it, but the reality is, is that they realize that this person is being governed, ruled, and, 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 uh, and guided by way of Christ. Okay? Whether they wish to admit it or not, they see the truth of it. Or whether they wish to admit to the aspect of that truth. So this is why, again, uh, we see these pieces and parts. And so, I'm, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just reading and reading as I'm, as I'm talking uh, and going through this. So, again, the young women saw her and called her blessed. The queens and concubines praised her. And then the daughters of the Jerusalem sent her, and they say, Who is this that appears like the dawn, fair as the moon, bright as the sun, majestic as the stars in procession? And so what that boils down to is that at the end of the day, there is recognition that people will give towards that which is in some way, shape, fashion, or form. They have to acknowledge, acknowledge the goodness of God on someone's life. Whether they like it or not doesn't matter. The truth is, is that when you're in true relationship with God, other people will see it. They will see it. They will know something is special from that perspective. Okay? Read, let me read this for you. It says, the beauty of the church and the believers is not only amiable, but all awful as an army with banners. The church in this world is as an army, the, as the camp of, of Israel in the wilderness. Its state is built it is the, in the midst of enemies and is in rank, engaged in a constant conflict with them. Believers are soldiers in this army. It has its banners. The gospel of Christ is, a, is an ensign. Um, the love of Christ. It is marshaled and kept in order and under discipline. So again, knowing that, 
that helps to engage the aspect of again how god how christ sets us apart again to make sure that even in the midst of our imperfections that he still speaks life to the glow that we still have regardless of the things that we've done okay and glory and honor is is, is he's trying to bring glory and honor out of that out of the good and the perfect things that he has created uh, and tried to instill in our imperfection okay we as humans are all weak we're weak and because of our spiritual weaknesses this is why our dependence on god means so much in this day and time we have to re be reassured of not only the sanctity of god but not only the power of god but that we are in full dependence on god for everything and i think that when we begin to realize that this is where as the commentator writes says when the church preserves her purity really she secures her honor and, and, and victory when she is fair as the moon and clear as the sun she is truly great and formidable and this is what the daughters of jerusalem see so even in her imperfections this woman shulamite woman even in her imperfections that christ or even the man brings out the best in her by speaking of the best that god has created in her and if she lives by those great things that god has placed in her and not by the the evils and ills and sins that would, would really so easily try to overtake her then others are going to see god's glory through her okay people are going to see the manifestation of god's power through weakness in her and that should cause for all of us all of us to really reassess our relationship with god every day as we're trying to become and be better because when you begin to walk in a godly manner by way of christ other folks are going to take notice of it and they will see it they they will see it and some will even tell you about it whether whether it's in a good way or a condescending or bad way but they will tell you there's something going on in your spirit i can tell that you are walking with god that you are allowing the holy spirit to guide and direct you and that jesus christ jesus christ is truly your uh, directive path that's the way that you continue to motivate yourself because there's certain things about you that that are becoming more tied and more uh, of a more um more of a resemblance of what christ looks looks like versus what the sin that maybe you did in the past looked like on you because again people think they know you people don't know you christ knows you he knows what he's put inside of you because he created you and he wants that light to come forward so that it will usher out come out and be vibrant and be bright so with that being said um, i'm actually done with this uh, particular lesson we're going to get through verses 11 through 13 and then get into chapter number seven on next week so i hope that this lesson has um definitely blessed your soul um excuse me i, I had a good, i had been talking for about 10 minutes in my video first video um something happened to facebook that messed it up so i had to record so i've actually been been on for about an hour um so i pray again this lesson uh definitely stirs something within you and allows you again to see god's glory um, how god can look at your can, can look beyond your faults and your unkindness and you not answering the door before and still talk about you in a positive 
reinforcing, uh, reinforcing um, op uh, uh, optimistic way that reinforces God's love for you, which is what he wants you to care and continue to move in. God bless you. Again, I see some folks um, that are on here on this evening. Um, please, ma'am, please, sir, we are back. Um, Noonday, a Bible study will be going on um, starting on the 19th of August, but we're back uh, for um, for our Bible study here at 7 p.m., and um, I'll begin at 7. Uh, no, so not I'll begin at 7.30, but we'll start beginning at 7, uh, 7 o'clock and go from 7 to 8 o'clock in our study. God's blessings to you. Again, we love you in the Lord. This is Pastor Hagwood, First Mountain Zion Missionary Baptist Church, exalting Christ to restore, renew, and rebuild people to serve the kingdom of God. God's blessings to you on this evening. I pray that this lesson is beneficial for you, and I'm going to close out with a word of prayer on this evening. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this word as it goes in faith. Thank you, Lord, for all that have uh, joined on, those will join on um, later, oh God, to see the pre-recording of this particular lesson. Thank you, Lord, for this book of the Song of Solomon. Allow us, God, to realize, Lord, that you want to expose the greater perfection which you place inside of us. And, Lord, not what man wants us to pay attention to with regards to our imperfections. Lord, our strength is made perfect in uh, your strength is made perfect in our weakness. And so we ask right now, Lord, that you make us strong, Lord. And, Lord, use our weaknesses, God, that we have, Lord, in order to build up, Lord, our, build up your strength in us so that, Lord, your glory is made manifest and that the light of Jesus Christ shines to all and they know that a change has happened in our lives. Bless us and keep us and allow us, Lord, to see your glory even more. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God's blessings to you. Amen. May God bless you. May heaven continue to smile upon you. Um, again, we'll be, we'll be back next week, 7 p.m. Again, to continue to study in the song of Solomon. God's blessings to you. Take care and be blessed on tonight.